I've often uh, seen in my Christian life that when there's this kind of coming together of ideas that haven't really been discussed previously, that uh, I kind of call that that holy synchronicity, that you're where God wants you on things. And so it's interesting listening to some of the things that people have said as we're preparing, uh, as we've been in worship already, because you're going to hear some of them echoed again in the sermon today, where we're looking at the life of Joseph, really, primarily, and then, but also looking at how his life and Jesus's life very often either run in parallel or there's like the, the contrast is so obvious that it, it, it kind of leads us to seeing in the life of Joseph a lot of the parallels that we see in the life of Jesus and just reminds us that the Bible is a whole and that the stories in the Bible are forming a whole picture. Even though they were written centuries apart by different authors, it's all coming, it all comes together. And today's sermon is really the one that inspired me to start thinking on, about how Joseph's life and Jesus' life run in parallel. Uh, because I was going to just do a uh, sermon on the life of Joseph, as we often do when we go into the Old Testament. And I began to see these parallels. And so that's kind of, this is the, this is the first passage that the light kind of went on uh, that we'll be looking at today. So there's a common saying, which I think many of us are familiar with. And actually, it's kind of been mentioned a, in a way today already is darkest before the dawn you know, that idea that when the, you've been that long night and it just kind of feels like it's never going to end but it is going to end and uh, oftentimes when it feels like it's just almost insufferable that's when the light dawns and i think that people have already said today but in history and certainly within the biblical narrative the stories of the bible you could also say that you know in the darkest night a little light shines bright and that's the we see that happen throughout the scripture in fact jesus is called the light of the world that he has gone into that darkness and within that darkness even find the the darker it is the brighter that light shines and uh when i was a young christian one of the things that uh, we talked about a lot when i was a, a an early believer i became a believer a really follower of christ in the 80s 86 there's this thing called the personal testimony, which was a big deal. And again, it's interesting that that's come up again today. And the testimony, if you're not quite sure what a testimony is, it's a little life story that centers on how God acted within your life. And it's kind of a, a shared thing. Like, this is how God acted in my life. It inspires people. And uh, it used to be a big deal to give your personal testimony. In fact, the church that I used to attend... It was expected that you gave your personal testimony before you were baptized. So as you stood at the edge of the baptismal, you had to give your personal testimony, which was terrifying. Uh, <laughs> it actually kind of put me off being baptized for a while. But I have to say, when I was, you know, really uh, bought into following Christ, though, it didn't put me off. The fear of, of the speaking in front of people, which is somewhat ironic now, given my life, was overcome by that desire to follow Christ. But there was kind of a downside to it. And if you've been a believer for a while, you know, people who grew up as Christians would often say, well, I don't have a good testimony. They'd be kind of sad because they don't have some dramatic story, you know, of, of how God acted in their life. Because sometimes these personal testimonies could get pretty dramatic, you know, about, you know, where people have been at. And so, you know, People would sometimes act as though it were, you know, kind of a bummer that they grew up in a loving, supportive Christian family instead of one where, you know, they were hooked on drugs and mom was a pole dancer and dad was a gangster. So you could have a really cool personal testimony of how God broke into your life, you know. And, uh, but the truth is, no matter where you're at in life, you know, we all go through our dark times. You know, it doesn't matter if you grew up in that, you know, wonderfully supportive Christian family or not. We can go through those times that are very difficult. And yet within those dark times, Christ will often show us that little small point of light that might look insignificant to other people. But for you, it changed your life. And so as we look at Joseph's life, as we follow his story, we pick him up. He's, fought, he's suffered a second betrayal. He was betrayed by his brothers, gets sold into slavery. He kind of rises to the top as in the house of Potiphar, but then he gets betrayed by Potiphar's wife, and even though he had acted with honor and integrity and responsibility, he finds himself in prison. And yet, while he's in prison, he still finds favor with the warden, and he's, he's put in charge of all things at the prison. And so we pick this up in Genesis chapter 40, and it says this. 
Starting in verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Now, remember from last week, we talked about that the captain of the guard is Potiphar. And so, I find it intriguing that Joseph is placed, he's still in the house of Potiphar, but instead of being in a place of favor, now he's in a a dungeon in the house of Potiphar. Because Potiphar was the chief uh, of security, he was the captain of the guard, he took care of all things secure, including, you know, the prison for the pharaoh. And we see here that Potiphar still uh, had dealings with Joseph. And when these two officials from the king's court, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, come into prison, he assigns Joseph over them. So it's kind of this interesting little like, dynamic that's going on there in, the, in Joseph's life. And it just made me think about you know, what it must have been like for Joseph to know that just beyond a few doors... His life had been completely different. You know, on the other side of a few doors, he was at the top of the heap. He was was the most favored within the household of Potiphar. But he was still a slave. He was favored, but he's a slave. Now he finds himself on the other side of the door. He finds himself still in Potiphar's house, but he's in the prison. And he's out of favor. And he's still a slave. And this is kind of a little side sermon here, but it makes me think of how many people go through life trying to find within this world a system which at best might favor them. And they try and figure out the system and work within the system, and yet they still find themselves very often a slave to the system. That your life really isn't your own. It's kind of dictated by the people who are paying you or have some kind of authority over you, and and you still feel like a slave. And even in the West, where we live at the highest level of of economic prosperity in the world, we're still a slave. Maybe in favor as far as the world goes, but that hasn't really changed the fact of what we are. And in this case, when we talk about slavery, we're talking about being a slave to sin. And slavery to sin is... An unusual one in that it becomes more restrictive. It becomes more and more painful the more resources we have to spend on it. I think this is why sometimes we see people who seem to have everything. Their lives just go completely off the rails. And we wonder why. You know, we sit here from our perspective and go, man, you had everything. You had money. You had fame. You had everything that we would think a person would want. But slavery to sin is an unusual thing in that the more resources you have to spend on it, the worse it gets. And you just, you can't help but be, find yourself in this, in this place of, in in the world around us, if we're not careful, that seeming to have so much in our lives, but there's so much that we can also lose. And sin can take us very quickly from being on the side of feeling favored, as Joseph was, then just threw a door into being in prison. And it can happen so quick. Through losses, through gambling and addictions, and materialism, and all the different things that can come into our lives that we can feed with our resource. And it just empowers that sin to destroy us. Now the scripture doesn't say... But I think that there must have been a suspicion in the court of Pharaoh that someone was trying to poison him. Poisoning has been the cause of death historically for kings, popes, and people of high authority for millennia. In fact, it's such a common way that people in authority have been assassinated over the years that offices like the chief cupbearer were actually brought into play. And cupbearers have been around for thousands of years. And the idea of the cupbearer is that he's the last line of defense when it comes to the king and what he eats. And so the cupbearer tastes and drinks of the food of the king. He is that last line. And if he survives, then it goes on to the king. And it's considered a very highly prestigious uh, 
position to have of deep, deep trust because if the cupbearer gets compromised, then that line of defense is gone. And the next guy that's also uh, in prison here is the chief baker, not a baker, but the chief baker. Again, a person that's dealing with food. So I think that somewhere in the court of Pharaoh, there is a suspicion of poisoning taking place or going to take place. And so they find themselves in prison. And the scripture picks up and it says this, after they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream. The same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him, in his master's house. Again, a reminder that he's actually, he's right there in Potiphar's house, just got a different part in it. Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams. They answered, but there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Jesus his dream. He said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it had budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me, and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in prison. So being put into prison here, suffering two catastrophic betrayals. It's got to be probably the darkest time in Joseph's life so far. And yet within this dark, dark time, this gift to interpret dreams and to hear the voice of God within the human subconscious there is used to shed light on a situation. And Joseph is able to use this to his favor as he shares with the cupbearer what his dream means. It's a good message. It's a hopeful message. It's bringing light into the cupbearer's own dark days where he's afraid that he's going to be executed. And as Joseph finishes, we, he speaks up for himself for the first time in his story here. And he doesn't complain. He doesn't whine. He's not angry or bitter. He just states the facts of how he found himself in prison. And he asks for his life story, who he really is, to be remembered. And then the baker comes to Joseph. And he's hoping for the same kind of hopeful interpretation. But it doesn't work out as well for the baker. It says this, When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift your head and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat away your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. And he gave a feast for all his officials. And he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position. So that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker. Just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And so this is how this story ends for a while. Joseph had found himself between a cupbearer who forgot him and a baker 
And, he's, and as he stands between these two committed of a crime, they're both taken by the officials, the pharaohs. They're both brought in on his birthday. There's a lot of drama in this story. In the birthday, he brings up these two guys, and everyone's in the court's got to know why the chief cupbearer and the chief baker are in prison. And they're waiting with bated breath what's going to happen here. And he finds the cupbearer to be someone he can trust again and puts him back in that position of trust. But the baker, well, maybe he was up to something. Because he's hung. And yet the story ends, though. Joseph is again betrayed. Third time he's betrayed in his life so far that we see. This time he's betrayed by the cupbearer who, who promised to remember him, but who forgot him. As soon as he was out of his difficult situation, the person that helped get him out of it becomes a liability. I don't think so much the cupbearer forgot that Joseph existed. I think he just realized, I'm not going to put my neck out there for this guy because I've just escaped getting, my, getting hung myself. So he forgets him in the sense that he just blows him off. I don't think it's a physical forgetting. I think it's a very intentional forgetting. And later, something happens that he conveniently remembers him. And so Joseph doesn't even realize probably at this point that the most important event that's going to change the course of his life has already taken place. He's in this dark prison, and while he's there, he does the thing that is going to eventually be the, the event that carries him out of prison and into the court of the Pharaoh, and then from the court of the Pharaoh to the top of, of controlling all things in the land of Egypt. Second only to Pharaoh. But he doesn't know that yet. In the midst of this darkness where he interprets this dream, he has to sit and languish for another two years. Probably clueless that the thing that is going to be that point of light that brings him out of the darkness has already been accomplished in his life by God. And the parallel to this is pretty obvious, right? I mean, at the moment that seemed the most dark in Jesus' life, when the rest of the world either looked upon the, on, G, on this event as being the final victory where they finally put this troublemaker to death, or if you were his disciples, this event is, is the end of hope. This is the end of expectation. It's the darkest time in everyone's life. And in fact, even in this time, Jesus, he who knew no sin, has become sin. He, has, he is now in that place where the wrath that God has towards sin and the breaking of the law is poured upon Jesus Christ. Who hangs on that cross as a substitute for all. And yet, within that, Jesus never forgets himself. And Luke tells us this interesting story. It says, There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, being death. We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. And with these simple words and this simple confession, and in a sense, simple testimony that the thief gave, that I was a person that deserves what I'm getting but Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. With these simple words, this thief might very possibly be the first person forgiven from sin through the shed blood of Christ. The first person whose life is directly affected by the shed blood of Jesus, where his sins are not just set aside, but where his sins are forgiven. And the assurance that he receives from Jesus is he'll never be forgotten. Not like Joseph. This thief 
will not have to languish for years in uncertainty or in pain. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today I will remember you. And this small exchange between two crucified men would go as pretty much unnoticed by most of the world. There was probably either Mary or Martha or John that heard this exchange and understood the significance of it later on because all the rest of the disciples had run away. And on this hill called the Skull, where Jesus' prestige is such that he is crucified along with who the Romans see as his equals, which are two thieves, in this low, humiliating place, naked, beaten, and nailed to a cross. The action which sets into motion the salvation for all who believe takes place. Where he who knew no sin became sin for us. Where he pays the price. And in that dark, dark day, in that dark moment, there is this action of light where God does something that affects all of humanity and it would be so easy to miss it. And yet for that thief, what gets set into motion is that same salvation that God spoke into your life when you were in that dark place. And it's very often that in the darkest of times, the light of God shines most brightly. And for many, it's that light that changes the course of their life. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people tell me, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, that, you know, that most painful time of their life is also the time of the most impact when God takes hold of them and changes their course of life forever. God doesn't forsake. He doesn't abandon. It's like the song said that we sang. You'll never be forsaken. You'll never be forgotten. You'll never be abandoned. And sometimes that's an act of faith. You have to say that in faith because you don't feel it. But it's the truth. God is always at work around you, and sometimes his greatest work in your life takes place when you feel like he's a million kilometers away. I just had a phone conversation this last Friday with a friend of mine who is very dear to my heart. He's a guy that, he was our neighbor in our neighborhood, not our direct neighbor, but in our neighborhood. Our kids grew up together, and he became a believer and uh, changed his whole life. He went from a job he didn't like, just purely on faith, trusting that God has something better for him, went back to university. Uh, and he's my age. He went back to university, got re, uh, re-taught. He's actually a bit older. He's, he's 59 this year. And, uh, and got a job working as a person that helps other people find jobs, as a person that in that service community gives people hope. And I just found out that he has stage four cancer. And being a typical American man, he felt he was out of, out of sorts for about four years before deciding to go to the doctor. And it's, it's pretty late in the process. And I was talking to him, and, and you guys, some of you guys prayed for me Friday about uh, him. And uh, his name is Gary. He's not our Gary. He's a different Gary. And, uh, and, you know, he responded to this the way that I thought he probably would. You know, he's like, well, you know, I have a greater hope. I'll be fine. His main concern is, you know, how his wife's going to financially live for the upcoming years after he, he dies. Though he's kind of said, you know, who knows what's going to happen. They, they're pumping him full of chemicals and it says as long as he can take it, he'll live. Because, unfortunately, the system that he works in, he's got to get some more years in. It's not quite as benevolent and caring a system in some ways as what we have in Germany. And then he says, and you know, this has helped my son sort of reevaluate his faith. It's helped my mom reevaluate faith at all. And if God can use this to even bring me closer to him, he's talked about how he was brought closer to him, then it's worth it. And you know, I'm sure you've heard things like this from people who are going through stuff. And you're like, wow, 
This is where you know God is working them in extraordinary ways. Because there's this fleshly part of me that just goes, this is a tragedy. This is a tragedy. He's going through a time of darkness. His wife is going to be going through a time of deep darkness. And it doesn't mean that as he finds this place of hope that darkness will suddenly disappear. Like I said, Joseph had two more years to go in prison before he saw the light. Jesus still had to breathe his last breath. Peter tells us then he descends into hell and speaks to the, the, the spirits that were disobedient and imprisoned in the time of Noah, whatever that means exactly, before the resurrection takes place. But it is going to happen. Those events have been set into motion by that light of God in that very dark time in their lives. And I don't know where you're at. Some of you are probably going through times. Everyone goes through times of darkness. Some of you are in it now. Sometimes it's because of physical circumstances around you. Sometimes it's because of just where you're at spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Sometimes it's all kind of brought together. Some of you are walking on sunshine. That's great. But everybody, into every life, a little rain falls, and there's always a, some darkness that we go through. And just remember in those times of darkness that you're not alone, you're not abandoned, you're not forgotten, you're not betrayed, and that God might be doing the work within that darkness, that little pinprick of light that will change the course of your life forever. Have faith. And sometimes just knowing that God does indeed know where you're at is enough to get you through that dark night. So hang in there if you're there. Keep praying. Don't forsake God. He hasn't forsaken you. Trust him. Look for that pinpoint of light. See where he's at. And if you have a testimony of how God has worked in your life as you look back over it, it's not just the time you became saved. It's all the different times where God has spoken into your life and given you encouragement. Share that encouragement with your brothers and sisters because sometimes it's hearing that God is working in another person's life that gives us hope when it feels like it's very quiet on the prayer front at that particular moment. So share those stories with one another. Carry one another's burdens and be that person of hope. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and thank you that you have indeed spoken into our lives. Everyone here who is a believer is here because you looked into our lives and broke into them and drew us to you. And Father, I think many of us would say that that, that impact became the most obvious to us when we were in dark places in our lives. And Father, we pray that you would help us to not just be complainers when we go into times of difficulty, but we would become explorers. That we would see where it is you're taking us. Who it is you're affecting around us. Maybe it's more than just us. Maybe we'll discover that amazing thing. We are at the center of the universe, and sometimes our story is there for another person to benefit from. But whatever it is, Lord, may we keep our eyes on you. And see that little bit of light that shines bright in those dark days. And when we get through it and we begin to understand a little bit of what that was all about and what you did, then may we share it with our brothers and sisters who are also on this journey of faith, who may be going through the darkness of the valley of death at that particular moment in their life, and they can hear it and have hope. And look for the work of light in their life. Trusting you. Never abandoned. Never forgotten. Never forsaken. Always forgiven. With grace extended to us. And hope. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.